Hello there, everybody. Thank you for joining me on this lovely day, uh, Sunday Christmas in July session for Fuse Glass Snowflakes. I don't know about all of you and what the weather is like where you are, but it has been a scorcher this week, which makes me just think of snow, even though as soon as it snows, all I want to think about is sun and the heat, but that's the cycle that we go through, isn't it? Anyway, today I thought I would share with you one of the um one of one of my favorite projects for the holidays actually. It's a really great project not only for creating um quick ornaments and such for craft fairs and art shows that kind of thing, but it's also a really successful class for me in the studio where I teach. And I've got a little slideshow that I'll show you a little bit later after we kind of talk about some of what I'm doing here and go through everything. But really, all I'm gonna do is show you almost exactly how I teach this class. I've got about six patterns, and I will link you to the patterns as well, kind of show you around. Um, I've, I've worked with this project for probably, gosh, seven to 10 years, I think. And I had an uh, original pattern that was super easy to make, and that is the one that I just showed you. And then I had a bunch of groups that continually came back to the studio to do this project again and again. So it kind of forced me to get creative and come up with even more patterns. So I've got a whole bunch of patterns that I'm going to show you. Um, I like to use the Honeydew Zuper Glue for this because this piece right here it has not been fired. And see how easy that is for me to pick up. I just put that together in the last half hour or so. And if I had a studio full of folks, which hopefully by this winter we can do again, but we shall see. If I have a studio full of folks, I have a kiln full plus of snowflakes that I need to get in there. And when I don't have to wait for glue to dry, I can get these in and out of the kiln really quickly. The firing schedule on these is a full fuse. And when you're going all the way up, you don't have to really worry about going slowly because there are just a bunch of really small pieces. And again, after it's fused and on your way down, you don't have to worry about this long annealing cycle. So this is a really great project for getting a whole bunch of things in and out of the kiln and turned over. And it's very profitable for the studio. The biggest part of the whole project is the prep in advance. And the prep I'll show you is really just cutting a bunch of strips. Um, I take my sheet glass and I cut quarter inch strips. And I'll discuss the various um, lengths. I mean, really six inches is about, I'll just cut a bunch of six inch by uh, quarter inch strips. And that's a really good start. Um, if you wanna go longer, you certainly can. There's, I have a whole bin full of strips over here. So at the end of every year, I can take all the strips and color uh, sort them into the fuse glass bins. And we can use those for various projects throughout the year, or I can just pull them out again when it's time for the snowflake classes. So let's begin, shall we? I'm going to take uh, the snowflake here and just put it up and out of the way. The first one that I'm going to start with is snowflake A. So let's give this a... Let's actually go to this view here so you can kind of see everything that's going on. So this is Snowflake A. Snowflake A, I've got lots of patterns, but Snowflake A is pretty much the basic snowflake. And I usually use a piece of cardboard um, to get everything from the tables and over to the workstation. And then when I'm ready to load it in the kiln, I can pick it up and put it down. I always document the pieces with the post-it and the person's name, and I'll show you that in a while as well. Um, it's really important. I have um, I have the Morton system in front of me because I'm going to be showing you how to cut glass, but it's really important when you're constructing these that you have a flat surface underneath them like a table. Um, otherwise, um, the kind of the divots in the surface can affect how well the glue holds. See, there's kind of a little bounce there too. Um, it should be all right though. So um, anyway, we're looking at this pattern, right? And we'll show it to you here. The patterns are all going to tell you exactly what, uh, what you need. So when we're building, here's Snowflake A, it tells us the pattern that we need six two inch strips. And here are the two inch strips, right? It also tells us that we need 18 one inch strips and you can see the one inch strips there, right? Um, the patterns have the size of the pieces on them. They are probably, you know, they're probably pretty close 
Um, with photocopies, sometimes they end up changing, but yeah, that's, that's pretty darn close. And you don't need rulers for everybody. You just get the pattern out and print copies for everybody. Then you don't have to have rulers for everybody. It makes it so much easier. And um, this is a great project for kids too. And sometimes little kids don't understand the concept of rulers yet. Uh, when I do this in classrooms, I like to have rulers for everybody so we can kind of talk about that and how to use rulers. But when it's just a fun, quick project for the family to come in, sometimes I've got three-year-olds working on this with their parents and they definitely don't know what a ruler is yet or how that works, but they can choose the colors and their parents help them mark it and then they actually cut together as well. And I'll talk a little bit about that so you can see how it's done. But first of all, I need to cut all my pieces of glass here, right? So I'm going to take, um, I've got some pieces that I picked out of my bin already. I've got some white and I figured the white would be my, I call these my legs, right? The white will be my legs. And then for my bridges, I'm going to be using some blue and some purple. I've got, um, I've, they're, there are parts of a snowflake. Well, let me tell you about the anatomy of a snowflake. The anatomy of a snowflake, I just told you we've got legs, right? And then we've got bridges, and then we've got embellishments, right? Those are the embellishments. So we'll go ahead and get started. So for my legs, I need two inch strips, and I need six of them. So I'm gonna take a Sharpie. I'm gonna take my black Sharpie, because the, the marks burn off in the kiln, I'm going to take my black sharpie and I'm going to go ahead and mark my two inch strip. Once I have that marked down, I can move it to the other side of the line and I'm going to make another line right there. And then since this is a six inch strip, I've got two inches left. So I have three legs, three legs complete, right? I'm going to take another one. This one looks like mm, these strips looked like I, I had a little bit of difficulty. So um, it's okay. I'm just going to mark one there and mark one there. That's going to be excess, so I don't need to worry about it. And then I'm going to take one here and mark that. So that's one, two, three, four, five. That is six strips. So this is extra. I can just put it back aside. And then I'm going to show you how I cut these. Now, when I distribute all the tools and everything to the tables, I typically don't have tools for everybody. I will take mosaic nippers and put them in a tub. We nip in the tub, and a lot of times I'll even put the Sharpies in the tub, but since there are more people at the table that can be actually marking than cutting most of the time, um, then I'll just make sure that everybody has a Sharpie, and then they, the, uh, the nippers with the lid go in between every pair of people or, or in between two people, because then they can share on either side of them, right? Then, the way that we're going to use these nippers, if you all haven't used nippers before, these are mosaic nippers, and I know a lot of fused glass artists don't really use mosaic nippers, maybe maybe more than, than used to, but these are a really great tool for cutting quick shapes, and, and even like, just, I don't know, random shapes, um, lots of the same kind of shape, but especially for nipping uh, lengths of, of uh, strips of glass like this. Basically what you're going to do, and a lot of times um, this is exactly how I explain it to everybody, with the mosaic nippers you want to hold the tool out in front of you and you want the wheels to face your other hand. So if the wheels are facing your other hand like this, then you will be able to see where it is that you're marking, right? You can see that exactly where it is that you're going to be marking. Um, and you're not going to cut your fingers. This tool isn't sharp, it's not going to cut you but it will score the glass and it could pinch you. So you don't want to get your fingers in there. If the wheels were facing away from your other hand, then it gets really hard to see where exactly that line is. But if you need to hold it closely, your fingers are getting into pinch zone and the pinching doesn't feel good. So wheels facing your other hand. For uh, I'd say fourth grade and up, sometimes third grade, fourth grade and up, this is the, this is the way to cut. They don't have any problems with it. You've got hand strength. So you want to take and you want to cut, but you want to make sure that you're aiming down into the tub so you don't shoot your neighbor. Okay, so that one I showed you. See how that piece went flying clear over there? We don't want that. Okay, so we're going to take, after we've got this set up, we're going to take and turn our whole hands 
Take all of our hands sideways, our hand and our body, right? We're going to go straight down into the tub, and then we can squeeze. And it goes in the tub just where we want it to. Now, alternatively, if you've got uh, maybe some big ice cream containers, the square ones, you know, the square plastic containers, the round ones kind of um, fly around. But alternatively, if you've got a big enough container, you can do this with your students as well, and they can just nip into the side of the container like that right? So sometimes they have a really hard, you know, some people, sometimes they, they as some people, sometimes folks have a hard time with the whole turning everything, like turning your whole body. They, they understand that they need to turn this down, but then they don't understand how to get there. Um, and maybe it's my fault because I haven't figured out the best way to explain it. But if they're having a hard time doing that, then they can just hold it normally and just aim for the tub and you'll have the tub turned over on its side, right? Work just as well. All right, so now I've got my, um, I've got my, my six two inch legs. Now I'm gonna show you what I do with younger students that don't have enough hand strength to use the mosaic nippers all by themselves. Um, and this, you know, I, like I said, I do this project with three year olds and up. Um, they definitely don't have the hand strength and sometimes, you know, the, the three and four year olds, sometimes they are successful with cutting or sometimes they just, you know, they direct mom and dad or um, parent or adult figure of whoever sort. They like to direct them. It's really good for them. They get to kind of tell them what to do since, you know, I don't remember way back to being a kid where everybody told you what to do. So it's a nice experience for them because they get to be in charge for a second. Okay. So now I need one inch strips and looking at my pattern here, I need 18 one inch strips for this basic pattern. So what I'm gonna do, this one, I'm already set with it. I like to get different tubs for the different sizes, even like the basic one, it's pretty easy to figure that out because there's just two sizes. But in some of the more advanced snowflakes, there are up to four different sizes of pieces. So it's really helpful to keep them all separate. Anyway, one, 18, or one, one of my 18 pieces right here, already. Um, so I'll just continue with this blue one. And notice this piece, how it goes kind of sideways like that. I'm not really going to worry about that too much. Um, it just needs to be close. These are going in for a full fuse, which means they're going to change shape. Um, if they went in for a tack fuse, the, um, and, and actually a couple of these have, these both went in for a tack fuse. So you can kind of I don't know if you can really see, they're still kind of squared off, um, but these both went in for tack fuse, whereas this one went in for a full fuse. So maybe you can kind of see from there the, the little bit of difference. Um, maybe maybe that's a better, a better view for you, right? So here's the tack fuse one. See how there's a little bit of texture there yet? A little bit of texture. Now look at the full fuse one, right? You can see how everything rounded off a little bit. We'll talk about this as well. But these are generally going to go in for a full fuse. A full fuse is going to make everything nice and round. It's going to make sure that all the layers are all held together. Um, and there's no texture, right? They're going to be nice and flat. So a full fuse, what happens when we're, we're working in the kiln? So glass likes to be a quarter of an inch thick or six millimeters thick when you fully fused it. Even if you haven't fully fused it, it's working on getting to that nice comfy layer that it, or uh, thickness that it likes, right? So two layers of glass are gonna remain about the same size um, width-wise and height-wise because our sheet glass is about an eighth of an inch thick. So if you take one piece of glass and full fuse it in a kiln, it's gonna try and shrink in until it gets to that quarter of an inch height, right? So that means the footprint, it's gonna get skinnier, right? If I put a second layer on there, it's just gonna relax into the shape that you've built because that's the perfect height, right? The edges are just gonna round off. It's not gonna be square, it'll be round off. If you add another layer, suddenly now we're higher than we need to be. So the glass, it's going to relax downward and grow outwards. Okay, so um, if you don't follow this, it's not necessarily important. I always tell my students this so that they can understand some of these patterns because some of the more advanced patterns, 
you can add extra layers and get the glass to move on you. So you get little extra embellishments here and there that get really interesting. So if you don't understand that, you don't have to worry about it. We can just start with the basics and you just follow the pattern. But the, the short of that is glass is going to strive to be that two layers thick and anywhere it's two layers thick, it's going to stay put anywhere else. It's going to move in or move out. When it moves in, sometimes it likes to needle and I like to mitigate that a little bit with fiber paper underneath the pattern um, versus directly on a kiln wash kiln shelf because some of the glass then, especially the opaque, can kind of grab onto the shelf and parts of it get stuck as I'm pulling it, as, as it's pulling in to get to that size. And then you have a little bit of cold working or grinding to do on some of the needle edges afterwards. And we don't want that. It's, it's just easier if you can um, avoid all of that, especially for these quick projects that are, you know, maybe you have a whole bunch of people coming into the studio at once, right? All right, so I've got my marks here. I've got one, two, three, and I've got four. So I need at least six for the inside and then six and six of the outside. That's just going to depend on how much I have going on here. Um, it might be, you know, I, I might end up changing my pattern for whatever reason based on, um, you know, can, you can do so many variations with that. this. There is no right or wrong. And like I said, I have a slideshow at the end, so I'll show you a bunch of the different color combos that I have. All right, now, this piece of glass here, you, it's probably hard for you to see with this blue glass. I can see the lines on that really easily, right? Right, there are the lines, not a problem, right? The purple glass, though, it can be a little bit harder to see the mark. So I'm gonna mark this and then pull it up to the camera and see if you can see what I'm talking about here. Um, a lot of times, I encourage people to always use black because then they don't have to clean their piece after they're done. Black sharpie burns off in the kiln so let me see right it's really hard to see that but if i turn it sideways and kind of catch the light on it oh see there's a couple marks there's a mark right there right then you can kind of see the marks right so i encourage people to use the black and then kind of try and catch the light and even by holding this up um even just this far off the table i can see through and i can see where the black lines are so uh, one, two, three, four, five, six there. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, so I'm going to do more of these. I'm just going to cut more than I need because it's, it's, uh, then I won't have to worry about thinking too much while I'm showing you what's going on here. Okay. So how do I let, um, the, how, how do I, how do I instruct the kiddos, the littles to cut? So when the littles are cutting, we need two people. Um, they have a hard time doing this. So a lot of times they'll try and do this. And this um, doesn't give them any leverage. It's actually harder to cut that way. So what I tell them to do is take their mosaic nippers and put the wheels facing up. Put their hand over this like they're going to be rowing a boat, right? Ooh, rowing a boat, right? So they got that first hand there. Or riding a bike, actually, is what I say. They're riding a bike and the wheels are facing up. So they put their hands on the handlebar. And then we go to the rowing because they need another hand. So they put their other hand on here and then they're rowing the boat, right? Okay. So they have two hands on the mosaic nippers. So obviously they can't hold the other piece of glass at this moment, right? Their job, whoever's cutting at the moment, is to make sure that the nippers are above the tub because that's where the glass is gonna land. So I show them how they squeeze open and close and that is the cutter's job. Their partner, their partner's job is to make sure that they get the mark right in the middle where the wheels need to be and then they work together and then as soon as that person can bite down, the wheel can stop. This person doesn't let go, they need to hold on. And then this person, imagine a hand there, this person's going to squeeze with both hands and then this person has the other piece of glass, right? And sometimes this is easier for, for adults to cut too. Um, if you feel like you need to cut with the mosaic nippers aiming down, you certainly can. There's no reason that you can't. You know, so I'm going to turn this sideways so I can hold the longer end. And a lot of times when I'm cutting like this, I will take this finger right here when I use mosaic nippers and I will, I will sit it on the outside of the wheel and then I can just kind of feed the glass in exactly where I need to go. And the other thing about these mosaic nippers, the secret, another secret that I'd like to share with you 
is sometimes it's really hard to cut glass with these guys. And usually that's because you're trying to center the mosaic nipper wheels in the middle of the glass. And that's great and all, but if you can pull it back to the corner and then squeeze, it becomes much easier to cut the glass. The one thing that you're gonna give up there is that the glass might cut off to the side a little bit, so you might get an angle. But remember what I said about this project, the glass is gonna move because we're full fusing it. That means that we really don't have to be too persnickety about our pieces when they're not exactly cut straight. That's why this is a great project for everybody, kids and adults included, because you don't need to worry too much about the results. Um, a lot of people, when they first start this, they get really worried about this, and then as they come back every year and do more, they understand what's happening with the glass as it melts in the kiln and how it changes. So they start to realize that, oh, the fact that it was cut sideways a little bit doesn't matter when I when I cut it. And I, I try and emphasize that with folks, but some people you just some people just don't learn until they actually experience it. Most people, that's how we learn, is we experience things. So it's okay. It's all right. Okay, so I'm gonna take this guy. This guy's ready to go in the kiln. I'm just gonna move him up and out of the way over here because before I build on my pattern, I need a piece of parchment paper. The parchment paper is really important because as we're working with glue, even though we're using baby dots of glue, baby dots are just a little bit, right? Even though we're using baby dots of glue, sometimes we use a little bit more than we wanted to or the glue goes somewhere we didn't exactly expect it to go, well, the parchment paper is gonna protect my pattern. I'm a little frugal. Midwestern, and my grandparents grew up in the Great Depression, so I think maybe I was influenced by that a little bit, but I hate throwing things away. So if I can get lots of legs out of this pattern right here, if, if it can last me a long time, I, I, I thoroughly enjoy that. Um, if I accidentally glue my glass to the paper, then as I pull the glass off, the paper pattern is gonna be destroyed. So the parchment paper helps a lot for that. It's a nice release. So I can put that down, and if I do get a little bit of glue that goes off onto the parchment paper, the parchment paper usually lets go of it pretty easily. So long as we're not trying to glue glass to paper, we're usually fine. So that's another thing I stress. I, I say it and then I ask everybody, are we gluing glass to paper or are we gluing glass to glass? For this project, we're gluing glass to glass, not to paper, okay? So, glass to glass. All right, now remember as I was talking, I told you we've got some legs and we've got some bridges and we've got embellishments. We're gonna start by laying down the legs and then we're gonna build bridges and then we're gonna lay our embellishments. Now, why do we need to worry about bridges? Well, when we put pieces of glass down, here's a piece of glass there, 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 and notice I'm following my pattern, right? Now, if I were to put these pieces of glass into the kiln, how many pieces do you think I'd get back? That always puzzles people. What do you mean? Well, if glass isn't overlapping, it's not gonna stick together. So I would get six pieces back, right? This is where those bridges come in handy. So we need to build some bridges so that this piece actually sticks together. And as I'm showing people this, I usually don't use the glue as I'm doing it because I'm doing a whole bunch of different samples, but it's completely up to you. Um, when I give demos in the class, I usually kind of hurry through it a little bit. It's probably, it's probably a bad habit because I think if I'm hurrying through it, then they're not, you know, the, the folks aren't really getting the best experience, but people don't like to listen to um, instructions. They like to jump into the project as well. So it's a little bit of a juggling act. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and figure out. I've got two, four, and six, eight, and ten there. And then I've got two, four, six, two, four, six, eight, 
10, 11, 12 of those. All right, that's, that's uh, more than enough. All right, so I've got all these pieces set up and we're ready to go. Um, I need six pieces for my bridge. And then I have 12 pieces as embellishments. And I have a full 12 there, so I could do all purple on the outside. But I was thinking I would do blue and purple out here. And then, um, let's see, if I did that, I did two, four, six. And I could do purple on the inside. And then that's, that's what I'll do. All right, two, four, six. So these are going to be extras. This is kind of why it's nice to cut a little bit of extra, because then you've got a, kind of a choice when you, when you get to this. Anyway, we want to build bridges first. And to build bridges, um, and I'll show you why I don't glue this first. To build bridges, we're going to place a piece of glass on na two neighbors, right? So now if I put this in the kiln to fire, how many pieces do I get back? Well, here's one. It's overlapping, so they'll stick together, right? One, two, three, four, five. All right, excellent. So now we need to continue with building bridges. So I'm going to go ahead and build another bridge. And then, wait a minute. Now that one's going to be really hard to do. Now, I'm going to backtrack just a sec here. When we're building these snowflakes, I always tell people we want to build them like we're playing with Legos or with Lincoln Logs for the older generation. I remember Lincoln Logs. Grandma had them. All right, so if you're building a, a bridge with Legos and you have one Lego here and three Legos here, can you take a Lego and slap it down and make a bridge? You can't. Likewise with Lincoln Logs. If you're going to build a bridge, you need a one, two, three Lego high footing and a one, two, three Lego high fitting or footing, and then you can build across. So what we really want to concentrate on is making sure that everything is even all the way around, which is why if I go across the street to build that bridge, I'm going to have a hard time. So I'm going to go next door to the neighbors and build a bridge there, and then I'll go next door over here and build a bridge. So now how many pieces come out of the kiln? One two, three. Well, that's still not enough. So I'm going to build one more bridge between each of those. All right. So before I do that, I'm going to use some glue. Now I've got the super glue here. Um, I have used other super glue in a pinch at the studio. And the problem with that is it is super runny. It is super messy. I've had um, people accidentally glue their fingers together. I've had people, <clears throat> myself, accidentally glue their finger to the super glue bottle, um, the little tubes, those little cheap tubes. Sometimes it's tempting to grab those from the hardware store. You can get six tubes for like a dollar. I don't know how many ounces is in each tube, but they make them really small because typical super glue, when you grab it and you use it after you've opened it up, the shelf life isn't very long next door go next door right there the nice thing about the super glue is it has an extended shelf life especially if you store it in the refrigerator between uses the other thing is it's a gel glue versus a runny glue so when I put it where I want it to go it doesn't run off and get all over my fingers all over my work surface it stays where I want it to so this this tube will last um, actually, I've had these last a couple of seasons, a couple of snowflake seasons in the studio. So I really get a lot of use out of them. So now I'm going to go around and build my second layer of bridges. And I don't know if you can see those dots that I'm putting on, but they're, you know, they're kind of big baby dots. I don't know. It's not, um, it's not just a little tiny bit. Um, especially right now because I'm using some bullseye glass and bullseye isn't flat on both sides. It's got a little bit of a texture on one side. So if you're using a little bit of texture on one side and you're putting texture to texture or even flat to texture, um, you're going to need a little bit more glue to kind of help fill in those gaps so that the pieces actually stick together. Because if you've got texture to texture and just the teeniest amount of glue and doesn't fill in, then there's nothing really for the pieces to, to hold on to, right? that makes sense. All right, so now I've got my bridges built. If I put that in the kiln, how many pieces do I get out? Exactly. So it's a snowflake, but it's a kind of boring snowflake. So we're going to add some embellishments. So that's where we come out to the outside here. 
and we're gonna put some little uh, mini legs on. How's that? We're gonna put some mini legs on. All right, so I go ahead and I like to go ahead and put in all the dots at once, um, especially if I've got people um, that are a little bit older working in the studio that can handle um, kind of multitasking or getting things done fairly quickly. Actually, when I use this, I don't always put the lid back on, but I'll, I'll let it lay, um, lay sideways while we're working in class because that way the glue is kind of already at the top. But so this doesn't set up right away. I've got a little bit of time. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to alternate. So I'm going to alternate inside and outside on these. And notice I put it in place and then I give it a push down, right? Hold it in place. And my pattern's moving a little bit. It's not a big deal because I can see it. If you've got students that are having a really hard time with this, a lot of people like if you can take some scotch tape and tape the pattern down to the paper um, because when it moves, it for, for people that get a little persnickety and, and um, pattern driven, like if, if you have a hard time visualizing what it is that you're working on because you know you haven't done it before, then when the pieces move around like that, it can be a little frustrating. So if you can take um, a little bit of scotch tape and just maybe tape two corners down, that'll help them. Um, typically, I encourage them to work through it because it's helpful for growth, but if they're really, really frustrated, I'll, I'll give in and let them do it. Um, but I generally like to challenge people even with a simple project. It's a pretty simple project. So I don't want to pick this up right away because it does take a little bit of time to set up, but in the next, you know, in the next half hour for sure, that's going to be all set up and dried and ready to go. So I'm done with those pieces. So I'm going to show you another pattern that I have. So when I demonstrate these patterns, I've got A, B, C, D, E, F are my, um, my basic patterns, and that's the ones that you're going to find. I'll just take a break and show you. Um, in my Etsy shop. So this is my, my personal Etsy shop. I've been working on these designs for the last, I don't know, a while, like I said. But um, these are the basic patterns and you get a little mini ebook that talks about directions and how to put these all together and then firing schedules. Um, and you here you can see some of the, this is like a 20 inch shelf. This is my personal kiln. So you can get a good amount of snowflakes in there. Um, and then also I just worked on my additional patterns as well. So then I've got, uh, I think G, H, X, Y, and Z, I think are my additional patterns. So you can get some, you know, other, uh, patterns working for you there, right? Okay. So I've got snowflake A. I'm just going to go ahead and move this out of the way. I could test it and see oh yeah look at that that's pretty good I can I can pick it up already right that's wee, that's not bad not many glues where you can do that right out the gate all right meanwhile here's my other one that I assembled earlier so when I go ahead and load these in the kiln I'll be able to put them right next to each other like that because remember they're not going to grow except where there's two layers so anything that's just one layers is going to shrink back um, so presuming that your people um, if, if you built them all, then you'll know if you built them all centered. There are some patterns where if you don't build according to the layers, um, they'll stick together, but they might fall down a little bit. So that's something you might want to think of. I'm just going to take that and put it over on the side. And then we're going to work on Snowflake E. Now, Snowflake E, I have already pre-cut the pieces for. Um, looking at Snowflake E, um, We've got 12 one inch strips and there, there's a, a spot here that says six squares of a quarter inch. That's optional um, and that goes down to the like adding embellishments and if you want it to kind of um, get bigger in areas. So if you put extra bits in these corners out here, then the star gets a little, um, it's a star, is what I call it, the star snowflake, it gets a little bit of a, 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 a a circle at the end where it kind of bulges out, right? So that's completely optional. You don't need it. But Snowflake E is kind of the uh, transitional snowflake between Snowflake A and Snowflake C, right? So they're, they look a little bit different and they're definitely different, but see how you can see there's a little star in the middle of the C? Well, 
we use Snowflake E to kind of bridge that gap. I use it when I'm teaching people. So I show them this one next. So this one we just need 12, in, 12 one inch strips and I've got all of those. Um, I did two colors so I want to make sure that I keep my colors separate um, because I'm going to alternate colors. And the cool thing is if you do this with red and white it looks like a candy cane. So candy cane star snowflake things, right? All right, so I'm going to take all my pieces and I've got them all already cut and now they're laid out. So I'm going to go ahead and lay down my first layer. Now remember when we're building we want to build in equal layers, right? So we're going to build bridges. So that means I, I don't want to build like this, right? So check this out. I'm just going to show you here. See how those pieces are kind of already falling off to the side? It's because they're not supporting themselves, right? I could glue them to get the glue to support them, but the glue burns off in the kiln at 600 degrees. And if they're not fully supported, when that glue burns off, those pieces are going to do exactly what they just did there. And pieces that are touching each other may or may not fuse together, right? Remember, they're trying to reach that quarter inch thickness. So if they somehow touch before they pull back, then they might stick. But most, more than likely, you're going to get pieces that pull apart. So we're not going to do it that way. What we want to do is build in one layer, our first layer, and we're going to go all the way around until we reach the other side again. Okay, there, that's our first layer. Now we can go in and build bridges. But before we do that, let's put some glue down so that we don't have to take everything apart and put it back together. I have some people that really, really like to cut everything and put it all together to make sure that's how they really like it before they glue it together. And I can understand that. Um, when it's your first project, especially like if you've never done this before and you want your project to turn out perfectly, I can completely understand that. However, um, I don't do that. Especially if they are doing that, tell them to not spend a whole bunch of time getting everything perfect that time because it's, you know, actually constructing and when you're gluing that's when you want to get everything perfect if you're just kind of testing the look of it lay it out quickly and then you can pull it apart again okay so I didn't tell you but I put glue on both sides of every piece that's down that's because it's time to build bridges and we're gonna connect the inside to the outside all the way around the other way right I got myself there there we go so I've used two yellows here for a star and I thought that might look nice. I don't know that I've ever done a couple of yellows as a star before. Um, I usually do snowflakes, and you know what they say about yellow snow, right? Um, you can use any color you want in a snowflake, quite honestly. That one, there it is, done. See how incredibly quick that one went? It was so fast. So we're going to take that concept and we're going to use it with Snowflake C. However, with Snowflake C, I haven't pre-cut any of the strips or pieces. I could go in and use my bucket of scrap over here. I've got a whole bunch of strips pre-cut, right? So I could dig through it and find just the pieces that I want. But maybe you don't want to take the slow route for building these. Maybe you'd like to go a little bit faster. Maybe you're producing a bunch of snowflakes for a craft fair. That is the slow route, the route that I just showed you. It's great for classes uh, when you are going to prep all the material ahead of time. So what you're going to do is you're going to cut a bunch of quarter inch strips. I am getting the Morton board set up here because I'm now going to cut all of my pieces, not just quarter inch strips, because I have a plan. I know exactly what I'm doing. So I'm going to take my candle and just rub it on the side there. Um, it's not necessary that you do that every time with the Morton system, but when you're using your glass cutter against the bar, you can build up friction if you don't have any sort of lubricant there. So that candle wax is really nice for getting rid of any friction. So the metal and the metal, they won't kind of catch. If you're using the Morton system, and you've used it for a while and all your cuts are great and then suddenly you've run into this piece of glass that keeps breaking wrong even though you're cutting the same way you've always cut it's probably the friction 
So if you can take and add a little bit of cutter oil or even a bar of soap or the candle across the edge of the metal, then the metal and the metal, they're not going to build up friction and you're going to be able to cut and then you'll find out, lo and behold, there was nothing wrong. It wasn't a bad cutter. It wasn't you. It wasn't the glass. It was just friction. Okay, so that happens every once in a while. Okay, so what I want you to notice here, I have put some tape along the bottom of my, my, um, my bar. I can't remember what it's called. I usually go ahead and label, label all the parts so I can always tell you exactly what they are. Like there's the cutter gauge which we're going to be using next. Anyway, here's my bar and I've got the cutter gauge and I've got my pattern hiding underneath here. Pattern C. All right, so pattern C, I need to cut six strips that are two and a half inches. Those are my legs, right? I need 24 three quarter inch strips. Uh, okay. I need 12 one inch strips and then I need some quarter inch squares. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and mark everything off. So I've got a pencil here. Um, a pencil is usually what I use. You could use a, a fine tip Sharpie or even a pen, but I want to make sure and pull my cutter gauge down because if I'm making marks and I'm using the edge of the um, bar as my zero point, then when I go to cut, all my pieces are going to be off because look at that, the cutter wheel isn't against the bar. So that's what the cutter gauge is for. The cutter gauge when you're cutting um, this right here, the edge of the cutter gauge, that is your zero point. So if I wanted to cut a two inch strip, for example, and I put my two inch mark against the bar, well, if I go ahead and cut there, the cutting wheel isn't against the bar. So the cutting gauge needs to come down. Right? And then it shows me, ah, oh, it wasn't two inches after all. So I want to take this and I'm going to get my two and a half inch marks. So two inch, two inch, two and a half. So I just want to put the, the line right underneath that cutter gauge and I'm going to make a mark there. And if you want, you can write in two and a half inches so you don't forget. Right? I need three quarters of an inch and I need one inch. So I'm going to pull this back to the one and I'm going to say, whoop, there's my one inch. And then I'm going to pull it back to three quarters of an inch and mark, whoop, there's my quarter or three quarters of an inch. And then I do need some quarter inch strips. So I'll go ahead and make that mark as well. So I pulled out and get rid of my cutter gauge. Now I pulled out some different colors that I wanted to use. I've got a turquoise blue. I've got a white and I pulled out steel blue. I like steel blue. Steel blue is fun. Steel blue, when you full fuse it and you don't cap it, instead of this beautiful blue color, you get a silvery color, which I thought would be really pretty as a snowflake. So the bottom side that's against the shelf will still say blue because it's not getting any exposure to the air, but the top side is going to be exposed to air and it's going to turn this lovely silver. I don't have any samples to show you because I didn't think about pulling those out, but I'll definitely post pictures somewhere in the next couple days after I get all these fired, right? Okay, so I was thinking I want to do um, just a couple of embellishments in the middle here as silver, maybe all of them silver. Mm. I think I'm going to do like I did with the other one where I rotated the purple and the, the blue inside and out. I'm going to do that with the silver. So I, that means I need um, two for each leg, right? And there's the three quarters of an inch strip. So two it, uh, times six is 12. I need 12 of those, right? So I'm going to have 12 of the steel and 12 of the blue. And then I think I'm going to do white on the inside. So I'm going to have, uh, these are the one inch strips. So this is going to be white. This is going to be white. And the squares here, they could be a different color mm, if you wanted to. Um, they're going to be on the inside. And I'll show you those um, when we get to them. They're going to add that third layer because otherwise I won't have pieces, you know, that, that meet with a nice even bridge. So I'm going to start with the white. We are going to cut six strips that are two and a half inches and a bunch of other strips. So let's see when I'm working this out, <clears throat> this is about six inches there. So that's more than enough. I'm just going to take this and cut my strips this way. Um, and I'm just going to cut six, quarter inch strips. So I'm going to have some extras and that's totally fine. So I've moved my glass. I want to line it up with that quarter inch strip because I need to cut a bunch of strips first. So I'm going to cut six quarter inch strips and I'm going to break them off all together. So here we go. Let's start at the top. 
And usually when I'm cutting, I'm standing up. So hopefully my pressure is really good here and everything breaks evenly and where I tell it to um, and not off in some silly direction. One, two, three, four, five, and one more. All right, I've made my cuts. I don't know if maybe you can see my scores. I don't know, it's really hard with the, um, the white glass to see the scores, but I'm gonna break these off all together like this. And these are my running pliers. So if you're not familiar with running pliers, um, when we score the glass, the running pliers are what we're going to use to break them. Uh, you put your score line in between the running pliers, the jaws there. They're pushing up underneath the score line and down on either side. So you just want to make sure there's enough room for them to push up underneath the score line and down on either side. And I'm going to hold back as far as possible, give a nice gentle squeeze. And it broke just where I wanted it to. Yay. Okay set that aside because we should be done with that. So before I break all of these apart and have strips, if I was prepping for class, I would break all of these apart and just put a bunch of strips over there, right? Because then everybody else is going to use the ruler and the markers to make the marks. I don't want to do that because I'm going to make a whole bunch of snowflakes to sell. And if I do that, I'm just slowing myself down. So I've got a plan. So I already know I need six two and a half inch strips. So I'm going to take this and move it over to the two and a half inch mark right there and I'm going to score that. All right, so now I can go ahead and break that off. There are my two and a half inch strips and then remember I need 12 one inch strips and if you're not sure why I've made six strips yet, it's because most of these patterns work in multiples of six. So I can cut two one inch pieces off here. So I'm going to move my score line over. Where is that score line? Okay, it's right there. All right, move that score line over. Um, there we go. And then I can cut my second one and then I can break those off. There's that one there and then I'm going to break those in half. So now I've got all of my strips and I am still torn about the other one. I'll just go ahead and break these. So since I've already scored these, I'm going to go ahead and break these into strips. And this is how you would do it if you were prepping for a whole bunch of classes. So notice how I broke them um, in groups of two from the six and then group and then broke those in the middle. Um, you, and I'm just going to <clears throat> throw those in my, my snowflake fodder pile. So as you're breaking these apart, you want, um, you want to break them off in groups of two. That's going to make it a little bit easier for you to break them off. If you're just breaking them off in groups of one, what can happen is the glass can get stressed out. And if your score line, if there was something wrong with your score line or there was some friction, whatever you end up with, um, the glass can decide to break funky anytime it wants to. All right, so I'm going to put my one inch pieces in there. So if you break them off in groups, at least you're cutting back on the stress between the glass because the glass, the smaller strip is going to be the one that breaks. So if you're trying to break a quarter inch strip off of a bigger piece over here sometimes it'll get those crazy cuts like we experienced earlier like some of the strips that I, I was cutting you maybe noticed that anyway all right 12 one inch strips six two and a half inch strips now I need 24 inch uh, 24 three quarter inch strips and that's the one where I was gonna alternate so that means I need um, 24 inch strips I need <laughs> 12 in the steel blue and 12 in the turquoise. And this is, what is this? It's like it's plenty of room. Um, how many is that? That is like three and a half. So three times four is 12 plus two is 16 times two. All right, so I'm gonna cut this in three quarter inch strips here. Just trying to do a little bit of math to see how I can save myself, you know, like I, I don't really like adding to my snowflake fodder um, because this is my personal snowflake fodder versus the studio, the teaching studio snowflake fodder, right? Okay, no worries. Anyway, that um, my math tells me 16 pieces times two, that's plenty for my, my 
wait, okay, I'm, I'm confused. We'll just cut it and see how many I end up with, right? All right, so I've made my mark that way. I wanted to make another, um, all my other scores this way. So that's two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, and I only need 12. All right, I got plenty. So I'm not gonna cut any more over here because I have plenty. I will break those scores and then these will just go in my scrap bins. Um, no, re no reason to make them smaller than they need to be if I don't need them that small because they're more versatile that way. If I had a pendant class or I wanted to make a pendant, this could be a pendant blank for somebody or it could be the, you know, it, it's much more versatile when it's bigger like that. All right, so I wanna break the cut. Um, I'm, I'm gonna break it lengthwise first because I've got three quarters of an inch on either side and then I'll be able to break those apart. And then I'm gonna go ahead and come in here and I can break these in half. We've got four and four and then I can break those in half and then I just break those down again. All right, so here we go. Nice and quick and easy. Now imagine, you know, this is going much quicker than somebody who might have to take a bunch of pieces out and make their marks and then cut them with the mosaic nippers, right? Much quicker. All right, and my last color, <clears throat> turquoise. All right, my turquoise one, again, um, just not gonna do math this time, let's see. Uh, or will I? Okay, so that is two inches divided by, or times four, that's probably plenty there. All right. All right, so I've got my three quarter inch strips there, and then I'm gonna go in and two, four, six. And I'm just moving my score line over to that quarter inch mark. Eight, 10, look at that, and 12. All right, so I think that's enough. I think that's everything I need. I'm gonna go ahead and break those big ones off and then break this down the middle and then into groups of, oh wait, hmm, what did I do here? That's six. Oh yeah, I only did 12. Okay. Whew, confusing myself here. All right, so now I've got all my little embellishments here. I've got my white pieces there and there. Oh, and I need the other pieces. So I wonder if I should, um, Maybe I'll do steel blue just for kicks. Um, yeah, why not? I'm gonna go ahead and cut another couple of strips out of this. And when I do the little squares, I typically just use my mosaic nippers for those. Um, remember these squares over here, right? I typically just use my mosaic nippers because it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be about-ish, right? Um, so I'm gonna go with the quarter inch six squares. One, two, three, four, five. There's plenty there. I'm gonna cut one extra because this guy is a little bit um, rounded at the top. Okay, so here we go. Move my bar out of the way. This guy, I can pick him up and move him over to the next bunch, the kiln shelf, right? We're going to go in here and put my parchment paper down. And again, I'm going to start with my legs. Now, this is a little bit different. So I'm going to take my legs and I'm going to put my legs down first. And there's a couple ways that you can build this. But with the super glue, this way that I'm building here is actually pretty handy. Okay. Now, remember before when I was saying that we did not, whoops, here we go that we did not want to do something like this where we're balancing things. In this case, we can make an exception. It generally turns out fine when you just have a couple of little embellishments. Typically they'll fall and they'll be able to stay, you know, they'll, they'll melt exactly where you put them. But we're not gonna worry about those first. We're gonna go ahead and do the inside first. So the inside, we need to start building some bridges, right? But before we can build any bridges, we need to have another piece in here. 
right? Because if we put if we put this piece down there, there's nothing holding it together, right? Okay. So if I've got that together, then I can take and I put a little bit of glue here and whoops, a little bit of glue there. And then I can build my bridge. Right? See that bridge? Perfect. So now remember when we go back to C, I don't want to build this way first, right? I think I did something wrong here. Go like this. All right, there we go. Maybe? Oh, I don't know. I think I need more, um, I need 12 of those quarter inch squares for what I'm doing here because I did something wrong. But if you get the pattern book, it tells you everything that you need to know. Um, it's obviously not snowflake season, so I'm a little out of practice. All right. Nothing like improvising though, right? Okay, so there we go. I'm going to go ahead and build that one there. And then I'm going to put another little guy here. I think the other thing that I like to do with this one is I will um, take and do the outside pieces first. Um, so it just kind of depends on how you want this to turn out. Um, if you put the embellishment pieces down first, then you only need the one quarter inch square. But I'm showing you a little bit more advanced um, way to do this, right? So let me just demonstrate that first for you though. So if I take and put if I take and put these guys down first, I'm just going to throw some down there in whatever form. If I take and put those guys down first, then I can also put this down first. And then this piece goes across like that, right? And that's where you don't need to worry about multiple extra little quarter inch squares. So what I'm showing you is a little bonus, right? You get to learn how to improvise with the pattern. Um, the difference between these two is that that blue is going to be hidden underneath the white on the front side, which is the rounded side. You'll be able to see it from the back side, but say you wanted to see it from the front side, so you had the blue on the top. Well, that's what we're doing over here. Okay, so we're just going to need a couple of more, um, more squares. Actually, maybe I'll just change it up on you, and then we'll just do it the way that I'm going to show you. Okay, so if you're following the other way to do it, great. If not, I'm switching it up on you, right? So I'm going to go like this. What did she just do? I turned everything sideways. So we're going to do just like I showed you, which means that I need my embellishments to go down first. But I'll just go ahead and keep finishing this, right? Wait, so I needed to go this way. So I'm going to finish all of these pieces in the exact same way. <clears throat> Try not to confuse you too, too much. Good luck. All right. Keep up, everybody. All right. So one there and one there and one there, and one there. All right, so now I can put two more legs in here, or two more bridges, rather. All right, and let those set up. But in the meantime, I can start laying out some of my embellishments. So I'm sure I've confused you by now, but We'll see. We'll see what happens. You'll figure it out. When you see the end result, it'll all make sense. It will all be clear. All right. So there's just a couple. We're going to go ahead and I like on these ones, we want to put the glue where the pieces are going to overlap, right? Because if the glue is where the pieces aren't overlapping, then it's really not serving much of a purpose. All right. So I'm going to take this and put it down just like that, right? So now what I've done is I've got one layer, my embellishments are one layer, and my legs are one layer, or the bridges are one layer, right? So I'm going to take this one too and do the same thing there, and then I can show you why you only need six of the quarter inch strips if you build it this way, versus the other way you'd need more. All right. Okay, so there we go. Now I've got a level area over here to build this bridge to connect them, right? So typically when I'm building this one, this is a little bit more complicated and I warn people, but once you figure it out, it's not so bad. So I usually make like a cheat sheet. This is the cheat sheet. Whoops. Pick that up a little bit too soon. Um, this is the cheat sheet, right? Um, the cheat sheet is telling people basically 
what exactly they need to build. And you need to build six of these. And if you build six of those, then you can put them all down and then you connect the bridges. All right, so there's my first piece. So now I can go ahead and connect the bridges and that's the spot where I can connect them. Make sure you get a little bit closer there. All right, so you can kind of start to see where this is going now, I hope. Go ahead and flip that one over and flip that one over and put some more put some more embellishments down. So all my turquoise are going on the inside here. And steel blue is going on the outside there. Just little baby dots of glue and then we'll put this across the top like that. And then I'm able to connect the dots here. So hopefully I didn't confuse you so much that you can't see where I ended up, right? Just keep dropping pieces down there though. All right, so here we go. Now I've got half of my snowflake done, right? So I'm just gonna keep building in that exact same way, right? So if I put these down first, and then put my glue on those and build my bridges, then I only need the six dots. Um, if you were doing it the other way, you'd end up needing even more dots in certain areas. And there's nothing that says that you can't add more dots um, here and there. Uh, I've done this pattern in the past and added some embellishments on the end of those to kind of make them um, a little bit bigger because where there's just one layer it's going to pull in where there's two layers it's going to stay exactly where it is right so dealing with some volume control here all right let's do that so yeah the nice thing about this super glue is after these are all finished it makes it really easy to pick them up and load them in the kiln and I've got some pictures to show you here shortly but I may as well I'm so close I may as well just go ahead and finish this out these guys here and notice how I didn't put all of my pieces out initially right I just put some of them out right if I put down all of my embellishments all at once there's a bigger chance that they're gonna get knocked around and that's just gonna get people frustrated so I, I try and get people to just do one leg at a time for that reason but um, sometimes you know sometimes people like to see how it's gonna look all laid out and if that's the case remember tell them don't get really caught up on where you're putting everything because if you get really caught up and something shifts, you're just going to be frustrated. So if you can just get your layout close to where it needs to be and then you can go back and glue things together, that way, that, you know, you'll be able to see exactly where everything goes, but you won't get frustrated because everything's moving around on you. All right, see already this one's moved, so I'm just going to move it back into place. And sometimes I have to actually hold down on the pieces. I find it helps to kind of hold them in place that way. Because when that bottle hits, sometimes it's a little tacky and it moves the pieces out of the way, right? All right, so I've got one more over here and then I've got the one that fell. And also the lid that fell, right? We'll go down there. And... All right, where did that piece go? Here it is. And the lid's way far away, so I'll just get that later. All right. So there's Snowflake C. And I cut some extras, so those will go into my Snowflake fodder over here. All right. Um, so I, uh, you'll, you'll need to know how to fire these now. So, you know, typically I'll wait until everybody leaves after, you know, if you're making these production style at your house, just go get the kiln ready, take a, a snack break before you load these, you know, um, especially these bigger ones, the super glue really helps to hold all the pieces together. I've used Elmer's before and it is a nightmare. All the pieces fall apart. So by the time you get them from your paper into the kiln, then you're basically rebuilding them in the kiln, which kind of defeats the purpose of using the super glue because you can use the super glue in your studio space. You can be nice and comfortable. You don't have to be like uh, over the kiln kind of, um, hunchback over your kiln, right? Loading everything into the kiln, right? Um, once you've got everything done, it becomes really easy to pick these up 
and I'm, I'm kind of delicate with them. You know, I find a couple of points where I can pick them up and then when I load them in the kiln, I just take and, you know, kind of figure out how they're best going to fit in the kiln, right? And that works for the, the big ones as well. A lot of times with the big ones, what I'll do is, um, you know, this one's not, I, I'm not going to trust this one to pick it up just yet because I just assembled it. But what I'll do is I will take a piece of cardboard and put it on this side and then kind of flip it this way and then peel the paper off of it. And then I'm able to kind of, you know, I can either put it in the kiln upside down if I wanted to or, you know, flip it back over and pick it up and gently place it in the kiln, right? Um, so... Uh, as far as the firing schedule goes, like I said, these pieces are really small, so there's not a lot of volume or large pieces to worry about. You know, it's not like taking this piece and putting it in the kiln. You can take these pieces and you can fire them in the kiln as fast as you want to go, right? So if, especially if you're filling, um, firing in a, a fiber kiln, if I'm firing it with a ceramic shelf, sometimes I'll slow my firing schedule down a little bit because um, I've broken a ceramic shelf before and I don't want to break a ceramic shelf again, so I'll fire a little bit more slowly with the ceramic shelf. But in a fiber kiln, put your fiber paper down, you load these up, you can go as fast as possible all the way up to, you know, between 1420 and 1480, pick your poison there. Um, if you're at a lower temperature, you'll hold for longer, maybe 15, 20 minutes. If you're going to 1480, maybe only holding for five minutes. Uh, the nice thing about firing to a lower temperature is sometimes you can reuse your fiber paper that's in the kiln. Uh, typically the opaque will hold on to the fiber paper so it, it kind of, it, it'll destroy it anyway so you have to use more. Um, and then anneal, as you know, fast as possible down to 900 to 960, hold it for an hour and then I just typically let it cool down by itself and that's usually enough for annealing. Um, I do have a uh, slideshow to show you though. So here's some of the kiln or the, the snowflakes that are all finished. These are student snowflakes. Um, you can see this is snowflake B. Uh, here's snowflake C, another C, 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 uh, no C. Uh, this was my snowflake Z or G. So I have people take a post-it, write their name on it, and write the letter of the snowflake. And then this is my photo documentation. So before it goes into the kiln, I take a photograph so I can be sure that when it comes out of the kiln, I get the piece back to the person that it belongs to. Um, if you had a bigger piece of paper, you could have them write the colors that they use too, and maybe that would be helpful in case something got misplaced or, heaven forbid, you lost a photo. Um, here's some more. This is... Uh, these are snowflake Z that I didn't show you, but this is in the additional patterns that I have on my Etsy site, right? So just some different color combinations that you can do. Uh, here's B, and you can see on the corners or on the outside edges, the embellishments, I put a couple of little quarter inch pieces and added some embellishments to my embellishments. Um, I think I did that here as well. I put a little quarter inch piece on top of the green and the white. Um, and right here as well, you know, so I added a couple more embellishments to my embellishments. Here's some close-ups, my, my candy cane snowflakes um, in the studio in the wintertime. And just some, some more close-ups um, of some of the fired snowflakes. So you can see in the, the full few schedule, you can see how some of the pieces, when they were a quarter of an inch, how they get a little bit skinnier in the middles there, right? And here's the, you know, the little uh, quarter-inch pieces that make help fill the, the gaps and the bridges, so you can still kind of see those. Here's those embellishments on the embellishments I was talking about for Snowflake B. And you can even go in <clears throat> and make some like cut sheets out of glass. On this one, I used some stringers and I made some candy cane looking glass before I cut it into quarter inch strips. And here's, uh, this is um, the second additional patterns on, that I have on the Etsy site. There are four additional patterns and then two of the patterns have alternate. Um, this is one of the alternates. So these are all the same pattern, but this is the alternate layout. So it turns out just a tiny bit differently. Um, again, this is, uh, this is from the first set and it's just a little bit different from, from the original pattern. And that's the candy cane snowflakes. They're a lot of fun. This is before they're fired and then you, know, you can see after they're fired. I just thought I'd show you, this is, this is one of the kiln loads after the classes. So this is a coffin kiln that we have at the studio. It can hold a lot of snowflakes. 
think it's like four feet long by a couple feet deep. So there's lots and lots of snowflakes. And with the strips, some people build Christmas trees. Um, some people get creative with these and go nuts layering in different, different ways. Here's one um, that I didn't show you, but this is from the additional snowflake patterns. And then I always like to have, you know, just white snowflakes can be really beautiful. These look kind of blah on the table, but put them in a tree. Um, at the studio I work at, the People City Mission in town here does a, um, I think they call it Starry Nights Christmas Tree Festival every year. And they have designers design Christmas trees and then those are auctioned off um, for people in need. Uh, the, the, the proceeds go to people in need, especially during the holiday seasons. And we did a blue Christmas tree with all white snowflakes. So kind of an up close view of some of these snowflakes. This is uh, the most complicated snowflake in the first set of instructions. Um, lots of pieces there. Um, and I have some of my students that come in that do that. I always generally say, give yourself two hours for that one because it's going to take a long time if you have to make the marks on the strips and then put those together. It doesn't take quite as long if you're cutting them like we did on the last snowflake. And you can see I did a variety of all of the, the patterns. Um, so yeah, that is... That is it for the No Days... Uh, studio session with the fused glass snowflakes Christmas in July. Uh, so I used the honeydew zipper glue for this. If you want to buy this, you can head on over to the No Days Adhesives website. I think you can even get it from the Facebook page. You just click on the, uh, the shop now page or whatever. But um, the zipper glue, I like to store this in the refrigerator when I'm not using it. It has a two year shelf life from the production date. So you look at the bottle and you find the production date on there. Um, and they're, I usually, you know, keep these pretty fresh. I don't like to sit on them for long because otherwise they just go bad. But um, keep them in the refrigerator and these guys will last you a good long time. And, you know, it's, it's like there. I barely used any for this project. I've got some other uh, fusing projects that I use the Zuper Glue on too. A lot of like multi, um, multi-firing pieces, you can tweak the way that you do those and arrange the pieces differently. So maybe I'll post some uh, photos to this thread to give you some inspiration. Um, when you're firing super glue, just make sure you're not um, you're you're giving yourself ventilation. You've got a place for that air to go out to, right? Um, you don't want to be in your house with a bunch of super glue burning off. You're not using a whole lot, so you shouldn't be poisoning yourself that way, right? But you just want to make sure anytime you've got anything firing, like when you smell the fiber paper burning off, that's not a pleasant smell. It gives people headaches too. So you just want to make sure that your kiln is in a ventilated space when you're firing this stuff. Um, just like anything, really. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, post the questions in the comment or e email me at info at nodaysadhesives.com. And everybody enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for joining in, and we'll see you the next time we do one of these.